and made. It's highly political. It is preventable and it can be stopped. Thank you. Thank you. And um, effectively, that's what I'd like to hear more from you. You know, all of the hundreds of people that are joining us in this conversation, uh, you know, would like to know just briefly, how did we get to this place in the war in Yemen today? Just give us a, a brief summary of what's important for us to know, and particularly what's important for us to understand about the Western countries' uh, inter-engagement in this, in this context. Yeah, I think a lot of people hear about the war in Yemen and uh, they remember the Arab Spring, uh, which took the MENA, the Middle East and North Africa, by storm in late 2010. And Yemen was among those countries that poured into the streets in a country that is highly armed, second to the U.S. per capita. The protests were peaceful at the beginning. On the streets, there were women, marginalized communities, uh, all kinds of warring factors, all calling for change independence and wanting to oust the 33-year uh, running dictator, Ali Abdullah Saleh. And the revolts, like I said, were peaceful um, until they weren't, until um, warring uh, factions found that there was a gap hey, that Shabab. they wanted to fill. Um, but, you know, that was in about 2011. So civil unrest in Yemen continued for the next three years. Ali Abdullah Saleh stepped away and put uh, Abdul Mansur Hadi in his place. But the political transition led to mass unrest. So in September of 2014, one of the warring fact, uh, factions, the Houthis, or Ansarullah, staged a coup and marched down to the capital and took over Sana'a, the capital of Yemen. They put uh, Hadi uh, under house arrest. Uh, and from there, Hadi fled to Aden, which is in the south, which um, I believe uh, one of the hospitals in this film uh, was made there. That's when the civil war broke out between one of the factions, the Houthis, and the army that's loyal uh, to the Hadi government. There were internal uprisings in the south and um, in different areas as well, all wanting independence. Um, but something changed in March of 2015. As the Houthis got closer to Aden, Hadi then fled to Saudi Arabia. And what he did is he appealed for international inter intervention. Saudi Arabia then hastily assembled an international coalition. It came together to intervene in the war in Yemen. We often refer to this team as the Saudi-led coalition because it is led by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And it includes a, a bunch of other countries that have gotten in and out of this coalition. But it has been consistently led by Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And what happened in March, on the eve of March uh, of 26, March 26th of 2015, almost six years ago, Saudi Arabia, under the leadership of Malik bin Salman, who had just became Minister of Defense after his father passed in January of that year, Muhammad they launched Bishman. airstrikes on Yemen, abruptly escalating a local civil war into a regional inferno. And since then, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and like I said, the coalition, which has included Arab countries of Kuwait, Bahrain, Egypt, Sudan, Papa. Morocco, Senegal, have been bombing Yemen from the air. So for listeners who are thinking, okay, well, that's sad. So many countries are bombing the poorest country in the Arab world, but it's happening over there. Far away, let them, let them deal with it. Actually, the coalition has been backed and supported by the U.S., the U.K., and other partners who have been providing the coalition with, for example, in the U.S., uh, we train Saudi forces. We also maintain, repair, and upgrade the coalition's vehicles and aircraft. We provide the intelligence support and the targeting assistance. So if we remember in August of 2018 when a school bus was bombed. Oh, come on. What happened? Okay, we seem to have lost... Uh, Did the CIA time. just cut so her off? we're going to... Um, we're going to continue... Um, we're going to continue our conversation. Um, Sky, I wonder if you want to just say um, yeah, something more okay. about the context. You know, um, Jahan was saying something critical about the engagement of Western countries in that context before we bring in our next guest. That was scary. Yeah, 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 yeah okay. sure. Let's just talk about the, the, the status quo in a nutshell, right? Because that was great, great sort of background to it. So, you, you know, the this conflict is often characterized simply as a proxy war, um, but it's far more than that. Um, the reality regardless of, of how it's built out, is that right now, um, this is um, 
there is an air blockade over much of the country led by the Saudi coalition. So the airport in Sana, right, is dedicated only to UN and UN flights. Airline, see, bro. Which is an incredible barrier to medicine coming into the country, which is an incredible barrier to doctors coming in and out of the country and patients who need long-term chronic care um, getting out of the country. So that's a major issue. The foreign sanctions on banks is also a major issue. It's caused in, in part an incredible um, spike in inflation, which has caused food prices to become simply out of reach for many Yemenis. So even when there is food um, in, in the markets, people can't afford it. And then there's of course the sea blockade as well because of the contested port of Hadeda. So it, it's, it's incredibly complex. It's not entirely accurate to call it um, a, oh, a proxy back. war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It's, it's much more than that. Right, thank you. So Jahan, we, uh, we lost you for a moment there, but we did, um, you know, Sky just helped us to see the, the connection of certain Western governments and their support of this coalition, as well as other policies, including sanctions that further worsen the humanitarian context, uh, as well as, you know, opportunities to, you know, even for NGOs uh, like Search for Common Ground and others to actually do peace building work. Jahan, I have one more question for you, you know, in founding, the Yemeni Action Coalition, you said to yourself, there's a role that civil society can have. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what is it that you're really trying to Yemeni achieve Alliance with Committee. this Action Coalition uh, before we bring in our next guest. Yeah, I apologize for that disruption. Uh, I don't know what happened, um, but I'm glad to be We're back. We're happy you're back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Sky, for filling in. Um, hopefully folks are able to really um, capture and understand what the role of the West has been and why this matters, why this matters to American taxpayers. The motivation behind the uh, Yemeni Alliance Committee are the memories I had of, of a different Yemen on my summer vacation growing up. Yemen was a piece of heaven on earth. It's home to mocha coffee for those who are coffee lovers, uh, home to uh, the rarest dragon blood trees, I uh, welcome folks to look up Yemen's history before it became known for poverty and war. Um, so Yemeni Alliance can be the national... How's the audio, guys? Can you guys hear me? Fine. We're a group of volunteer Yemeni American organizers. So we have other full-time jobs. Uh, we were formed out of the Bay Area. And we have chapters um, across the country now. And, um, you know, we began protesting in 2014 when it was just a civil war. Um, but things really changed uh, in 2015 because it was clear to us that the support in the arms of the U.S. Um, is it's something that the coalition would not have the capacity and equipment to wage this war without it. So we are fueling the war in Yemen. The U.S. is complicit in this war. So we started lobbying our lawmakers. And we know that thank you. some representatives they didn't even know where Yemen was. So we had to bring a map of Yemen with us. Wow. Anytime we'd lobby, lobby, we'd bring a, a map of Yemen. Setup mode some is folks off. Been impacted. Just a moment while this um, device reconnects. Shut up, Alexa. Airstrikes. And uh, I think people need to understand that Your the echo is Yemen ready. do know that these bombs are made in the USA by companies such as Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Boeing. The Pentagon's budget makes up the largest percentage of overall federal budget of the United States. Uh, for example, in the U.S. Uh, in 2018, the budget was $732 billion. Billion That's dollars. more than 10 countries combined. That's 15% of our budget. And when we think of where money is going when it comes to education and health care, that money is being pulled out of those sectors to ensure that uh, wars like the ones in Yemen and elsewhere are continuously to be uh, fueled and funded. When we think about um, our tax returns on April 15th, you know, portion of that goes to that budget. So we right. are it complicit as well. And I know that, um, you know, sometimes we don't have a part, uh, we don't have a vote in where our money goes, but we definitely do have a vote in who we vote for um, and um, what kind of policies that we help push. Um, you know, after the Muslim ban was put into effect in 2017 by Trump, which is still in effect actually, still separating families, we really began to try to push uh, to change system. So we started working with progressives like Brokhana, anti-war groups who've been lobbying to end endless wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, and Do we lose her again? Okay, 
okay, we're having another technical problem with Jehan, um, but we've heard a little bit about what that coalition is, and uh, you know, we will share the link with you as well for to learn more about um, about the coalition. So I'd like to bring in our next guest, um, who is uh, Honorable Andrew Mitchell, uh, UK Member of Parliament. Welcome, Andrew. Um, so glad you can make it today. To all of our guests here today, I want to say that we unfortunately uh, will not be joined by a representative of Kana. Oh, we no. have a last minute schedule change. But Andrew, you've had an extensive career with the UK government. You've held various ministerial posts. And currently, you're a member of parliament for the Conservative Party. And just to remind you know, people joining us today, Andrew, that in 2017, you traveled to Yemen to see the effect of the war firsthand. And oh, wow. upon your return, you organized an emergency debate in the House of Commons. And so I'm very interested to hear uh, what is it that you see as most important for the UK government to be doing about the war in Yemen? Well, good evening, everybody. It's a privilege to join you. And I watched the film, which, uh, as everyone who watches it will feel, is a, a desperate take on uh, an appalling situation. Um, the I became involved because, um, as a humanitarian, I didn't suggest for a moment that I had a political solution to what was happening in Yemen. But I, I regarded the situation as a humanitarian. And, and you asked about British policy. British policy, of course, has been incredibly confused because, on the one hand, uh, in Britain, a decision was taken by the government that supporting the Saudis um, was in our security and our economic interest for... Mm obvious reasons. There is cooperation in the fight against terrorism with the Saudi intelligence services and they sell an enormous amount of equipment to Saudi Arabia. So um, uh, on the one hand, uh, we were part of the coalition, but on the other hand, our taxpayers were funding humanitarian relief. You had at one point the coalition trying to disable all the cranes in Hodeida port, um, but on the other hand, British money being spent to try and get the trains up and running again. So the whole thing was extraordinarily confused. And very early on, I said that I thought that the policy was profoundly misplaced. This was, of course, before uh, the appalling treatment of the Saudi journalist and the consulate in Saudi, and also before uh, the What's jailing the of civil rights women who are standing up for their rights in, um, in, in, in their own country. Um, and I went, I went to uh, Yemen. I think I still remain the only uh, European politician who's been into North Yemen in the last uh, three years or so. And I, I went because the UN, whom I knew very well from my time in government there, showed the Houthi leadership in Sana'a what I had said in the House of Commons. And the Houthis agreed that I could come, and the Saudis, I think, subsequently regretted it. But they gave me a, a visa to get into uh, the uh, Yemen, and I went and I spent time in Sana'a, and I spent time in Sada as well, which I was, it's been very, very badly the damaged. Houthi stronghold. And in Sada, of course, I saw the demining team that was trying to defuse uh, high explosives, and uh, paradoxically led by a British major uh, and funded by the British taxpayer. I went to a school there, which had been very badly bombed. I was shown um, weapons markings which had British uh, uh, designation numbers on them and yet in the tent uh, provided by the British taxpayer were 30 children uh, learning and uh, hmm. they were being taught with British textbooks again provided by the British taxpayer and when I walked in they the all paradox. stood up and started singing a nursery rhyme or what I thought was a nursery rhyme and I remember asking the translator to tell me what they were saying. And the translator said to me, they're saying death to the Americans and death to the Saudis. But by dint of respect for your visit today, they put out the third uh, the stanza. British. And then I went from That's there a nursery the rhyme? that had been supported by Médicins Saint Frontières uh, in Sada. And Médicins Saint Frontières had had to withdraw because of the bombing. And I went up to the top floor uh, of the uh, hospital and I saw what is always the saddest thing you ever see in the developing world, which is a malnutrition ward where terrified mothers, their eyes wide with fear, are cuddling badly malnourished children who also have wide eyes and distended stomachs and are in great pain. It is the most I've seen 
quite a lot of despair, poverty and disaster around the poor parts of the world during my political activities in international development. But those wards remain the saddest and you're sort of infused with a fury because you see on the one hand Britain being part of this coalition and on the other hand the uh, fact that British taxpayers are trying to put a sticking plaster upon the effects of what another arm of government has been doing. Well, you know, from my visit, uh, I met, for example, Al Samad, who was senior Houthi in Sana, and who was a dove, and who wanted to negotiate, and who gave all the appearances of wanting the British and indeed the Russians to intervene, and was the guy that got a few months later in a drone attack by the Saudi government. So he was a dove. Houthis. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, so Samad was technically the president of Yemen under the Houthis and he was killed in, in a drone strike. Was that the, the, um, you know, the, the, the twin beliefs that it was in Britain's economic and security interest were wholly wrong because, of course, the more this war goes on, the more it will undermine Britain's economic interest and undermine the Saudis. Uh, and secondly, of course, uh, in terms of security, I can't think of any way more likely to radicalize thousands and thousands yeah. of young Yemeni men than knowing that the death and destruction which rains down from the sky every night on their families and their communities is funded and helped and assisted by the British and the American governments. So, so in, in my view, this has been a terrible strategic misjudgment. Yep. Countries do make strategic misjudgments from time to time. And I think we've gradually been sucked into this. And, you know, British ministers have talked about the need to get a, an agreement. There's a very skilled British international civil servant who is the UN special representative. You know, it's very, it's very uh, slow. Um, and I'll make this my final sort of opening comment. But, you know, in the end, these conflicts end in one of two ways. They either end uh, because there's an outright military victory. Well, that, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Right. Or they end uh, because there is eventually uh, some form of peace conference and some form of structure to bring the warring parties in. And, and you know, we did quite a lot of work on Somalia when I was in government. And actually, we've made very uh, considerable progress. Oh, Abdullah just joined to watch his best but friend, what you have to do is you have to bring in uh, the regional powers. You have to bring in the UN and the great powers. You have to bring in the different militias and the different warring groups. And you have to bring in what's left of civil society, because civil society has to rebuild from all of this. So in the end, you're trying to organize a free ring circus to negotiate. And uh, I believe that is what will eventually happen uh, in uh, Sana. But, but prescribing, as Donald Trump has done, the Houthis, um, uh, is a, a foolish, in my view, retrograde step. We need to try and do everything we can to encourage all parties. And I'm certainly not, I should make it very clear that I'm not uh, carrying any form of flag for the Houthis who have behaved appallingly uh, in the Yemen, as well as all the other uh, forces. Thank but, you. We needed you know, to hear Houthis, that were driven into the arms of the Iranians. This is a proxy war between Sunni and Shia. And, uh, you know, the Houthis Just to make it clear, they were not driven. They were say, always... So then, like, like, the founder like, literally studied in Iran, bro. You know, they are, they, they've been driven into the arms of the Iranians. And the suggestion... Inaccurate. ...that the Iranians Claim, but okay. are able to supply massive amounts of weapons into this conflict are completely ridiculous because the Saudis have... Uh, have cut off by land, sea, and air. How <laughs> is there a blockade uh, for aid, but not that's weapons? That's probably enough for me now, but I think okay. the quali right, quality of extraordinary misjudgments that have been made by the international community yeah. have made this whole situation much worse than it was some years ago. So you've, 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 you've painted a stark portrait of what you still are able to you know, evoke when you think of visiting those places, including the hunger wars that you saw with your own eyes. Uh, you've secondly just talked about how there are different incentives going on, incentives to make the war more severe, as well as incentives to try and actually I have no idea, bro. to a certain extent ignite uh, a, a peace process. Abdullah, so he was actually in Yemen in 2017, and he went to Sana'a and Sa'da. Is sufficient. We won't actually see progress on that. On that the the only European politician to enter Yemen in the last three years. What is most important for the UK government to choose to do 
at this point in time, given that you're characterizing it as a strategic misjudgment? So I should explain, it's been a very long day. I meant, of course, Saidi, not uh, uh, Isidi. Um, but my point yeah. is that, you know, they weren't, they weren't automatically an Iranian <laughs> proxy. They've been doing <laughs> that. I mean, I think that the British government should be doing a number of things. First of all, it should tell the Saudis that the bombing is counterproductive. I mean, no country has ever won a war from the air. You know, and if you're not prepared to put in tens, hundreds of thousands of troops, then you're not going to win. You're just going to cause yet more anxiety. <laughs> they don't even protect their own borders. There's Iran. literally Yemenis so fighting Yemenis the on UN, the border. The thrust of Britain, France and America should be to say, you know, you've got to stop the fighting. You've got to stop the fighting. If you have to do it unilaterally, then you do it unilaterally. Um, and secondly, uh, we should use all our diplomatic muscle, which is very considerable in Britain's case, with the Americans and others, to try and get people talking, to try and get the fighting to stop and the talking to start. Um, and we should put more effort. The trouble is that the world's been knocked off uh, the, the uh, kilter on this because of this dreadful year of COVID and, and uh, the huge difficulties that all countries are having themselves coping uh, with it but and if that hadn't, hadn't happened maybe more progress would have been made on the on, on the uh, yemen but uh, the quite extraordinary uh, failures to get uh, movement need, needs to recognize that you know that you, you can't just order the Houthis around they are there unlike the americans and the british in iraq where they removed the police and the army leadership the 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 uh, Houthis sat on top of the uh, existing political and practical leadership in, in Sana. They're not easily going to be removed. And the international negotiators and the international uh, community need to accept that their bargaining position is not very strong in that respect. Right, thank you, thank you. So Jihan, we've heard you know, these two things that, um, that Andrew is recommending, stop the war and incentivize a process for peace in the way that he's described that involves multiple stakeholders, including the Houthis having a real seat at the table. Uh, when you look at what it is that you're advocating in your civil society coalition, uh, do you have anything you want to add or, or a question to Andrew? Thank you. I hope that I'm not going to get kicked out again um, to let folks know there are trolls really uh, following people like uh, me in these advocacy spaces. So um, I just wanted to make clear that what is happening in Yemen inherently is not a sectarian war. Although tensions have began to grow, Zaydis and Sunnis have intermarried and shared the same mosques for years, for centuries, I should say. Um, but um, with respect to uh, strategizing and policy, I think we need to do, the international community needs to do more than just pressure the coalition because we know that what is happening in Yemen is systemic. There are policies in place that have allowed for the West to support the coalition militarily uh, with the sales of arms. I think what we really need to do is focus on canceling contracts because uh, the US and the UK, Germany, France, and Spain are the top five large arms exporters in the world. So it's not that, that we can just tell the coalition, please stop. I think that the international community needs this is to her stop bio, by selling the way. arms to the coalition. We all know that um, the Gulf does not have capacity to build F-15 uh, or any of that equipment. None of these warplanes are made uh, locally in the Gulf. Uh, they are being bought, and we know that that war is is a is a generating uh, is rev generates revenue. So there's profit to be made. The international community needs to focus on crafting policies to end support for the coalition. So like I said, end military support, and that'll include the logistical support, the targeting assistance, and end arms sales. And I think we can just start there and because there's a lot of other support that we provide. Um, but if we can just start there, I think that um, we'd be at a really good starting point when it comes to really building peace. I've, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going further than that. I'm saying, no, never mind about arms. I think it's quite a nuanced argument about arms exports. I've never actually called for an arms embargo. But I'm going further than that. I'm saying that the, the Brits should tell the Saudis it's got to stop because it's not. they're not going to win it. And, and if they're worried about the Iranian, you know, the sunny Shia split, then they're going to get humiliated. They're going to get humiliated. By, and the Iranians are laughing up their sleeves. So, so I'm saying that, that you make progress by actually Damn. breaking up the coalition and saying we're not going to do this anymore. And I think the Saudis for a while now have been 
have been looking for a way to to stop this um, and escape without being humiliated. And uh, you know, I think I think what is required is a is a much greater oomph in terms of negotiation on this. And I hope that the Biden regime and uh, uh, the reinvigorated global Britain will put their shoulders to the wheel and make certain that they drive this forward. It's, you know, it's, it's very interesting if I can just chime in for a minute, because as you said, uh, wars don't get won in this way. And the ability to... No war to has been won from the air. ...to do so without that, that humiliation. Otherwise, it just won't be yesable for all the wrong reasons, perhaps. But it's really very important, that point that you're making, Andrew, for us to actually find a way to mobilize international attention uh, towards a durable peace agreement. Um, Sky, I wondered if you oh, have sure. any other um, comments that you wanted to make around this discussion based on, you know, that you've screened this film in many different uh, communities. Sky is well. the director of The Hunger uh, Ward, by the way. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I mean, Sky. I really appreciate your, your full acknowledgement of sort of the, the muddled state response from both the UK and my own government um, in this conflict. And, you know, you, you've been to Northern Yemen, as I have uh, watched the film. You've seen that we filmed both in the north and the south of the country. And, you know, Makia Maji, who is the nurse practitioner in the north that we worked with, you know, she said to me at one point um, during an interview, she said, you know, the way we feel about the current UK and American response in our country is they feed us and then they kill us. Uh, why right and she posed that question directly to me as an american there um working with her very closely in the clinic uh, and, and i thought that beautifully sort of encapsulated this tension right this tension of the muddled response of both aid flowing into the country from the uk from the us from saudi arabia while the bombs are flying overhead at the same time and and you know that's incredibly ironic and and as is and it's offensive yeah, of course it's it is. Because it's, it's, it's basically off punching someone in the face and then offering them yeah. a, a sticking plaster. Right, and, and, and agreed. And I think, I think one of the, this is similar tension with the recent designation by the Trump administration of the Houthis as an FTO designation, right? Because as I, I concur with you that they have blood on their hands in this conflict, just like the Hadi government does, just like Saudi Arabia does, just like we do, just like the UK government does those just like Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula does. There are so many players and everyone in some form has blood in their hands, but the, the inherent irony in designating the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization, while your government and my government have military advisors in the war room in Riyadh, advising theoretically those bombing raids, that's an, a horrific irony to me. And, and I guess my question is, what, what can you do as a parliamentarian to push back on that piece of it because that's what we're doing here we're asking the incoming biden administration to issue an executive order in the early days of the administration to end all operational support for the saudi-led coalition what can you do in britain uh, in a similar vein well we need to we need to we need to lobby behind you the biden administration in that respect and i think there is a chance that will that will happen because with majorities in both houses now there, there is, I mean, I think the Hmong Democrats I spoke to, there is deep abhorrence of the way that uh, Jamal Khashoggi was murdered in, in Istanbul. And I think that uh, there's a feeling that uh, Trump let them off and it's simply not uh, not good enough. I mean, the, 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 the point I would want to just add to what has been said already is this, that the problem is made far worse by the fact that there is no legitimate government in Yemen. I mean, had his term long, long passed. And, of course, he was the only <laughs> name on the ballot paper when he was elected, elected. Which the sort of democracy that I understand. Elected. And he's also, for most of his time, being either held up, uh, holed up in Riyadh or on an Emirati warship, occasionally setting foot in Arden. He's one of the, he's one of the only uh, heads of state I've ever come across who has to make a state visit to his own country. So you know, that <laughs> makes the whole situation that much more complex and <laughs> difficult to get movement on. <sighs> Uh, and I, I, I would push back a little bit that, you know, I, I think there is a de facto government in the country Houthis. and it's it's the Houthis. Right. And even though they're not globally acknowledged by nation states, uh, with the exception of one, they do have a, a, a functioning form of government in the north. Functioning. Want, I fully acknowledge that. Right, these guys are Houthi sympathizers. Yeah, well, I, I, but they're in their de, de, de facto rather than de jure. I think I don't know whether Jahan might want to add something on that point. 
question was whether the Houthi... Uh, government no, I just thought about the governance, the governance of Yemen. I don't know whether... I thought you might want to just make some, some, uh, some point on that. Yeah, I think um, Yemen is currently under 80% uh, control of Houthi control, right? Um, so whether it's uh, Houthi control, Hadi control, I think uh, that doesn't really matter. I think the, the focus or the what? goal should be lifting the blockade, ending arms sales, and ending what? the of the West. And when we come, when we think about um, the Saudis being embarrassed because this is a, a strategy <laughs> that's not winnable, I think we have to remember that it's a moral oh imperative that, that was... Right. The people of Yemen are not being punched. They're being bombed and starved. Um, th this is really uh, dire. <laughs> and and two-thirds of the airstrikes uh, that have been pounding Yemen have hit civilians. So these are violations of international law that the U.S. and the U.K. have been complicit in. I think I think it's not yeah, Abdullah, look what, to what the happened US to Zach. UK to determine which, which way that the Yemeni government should head. Uh, instead, that we should focus on what are we doing to ensure that the peace process uh, is going to continue, and and that and that can only happen uh, is when we end this intervention, end the role of the U.S. and the U.K., and let the sovereign nation of Yemen determine which way the government is going to head. What sovereign I mean, I nation, bro? You, that, that it's not for the British and the American administrations to uh, involve themselves in the governance of Yemen. It is for them to try and make sure that the fighting stops and to and as mem both members of the UN Security Council try and make sure that uh, there is a structure for negotiation that's I think is is, is incredibly uh, important um, and um, you know the, the, the Houthi control is, is as I say de facto not de jure um, and I think that's uh, uh, that, that they shouldn't I mean although possession is nine tenths yeah. of the law trying to persuade and find ways of persuading the Houthis to negotiate and not just sit on top of this uh, cauldron is incredibly important. Yeah, I think the Houthis will be more than ready to negotiate or any other warring uh, party if the West ends arms sale and ends military support. Um, I, I mean, it's going to be incredible, almost impossible to talk with anyone at the table while the West continues to starve and bomb, you know, the, the yes, I, I, that's why I think that's why the key thing is to stop the fighting. Um, and um, give me a second, uh, guys. As you have so wisely said, I'm going to have to disappear. I'm afraid in a moment, but um, it's been a it's been a salutary. Guys, keep listening. I'll get uh, back to the camera soon. And at least we're all on the same side in wanting Damn the it. fighting to stop the and the is... negotiation to start. That is how this will end eventually, and for the sake of the long suffering poor people of. Yemen. I hope it will be as soon as it possibly can be. Thank you so much for uh, the generosity of your time today. And uh, we look forward to hearing and seeing more uh, of you around this. Thank you so much for your time today. Please don't end the discussion yet. It's not over yet, guys. So, Hold on. You know, Give me a second. We pivot, um, as we pivot, I want to just um, hear from you. Uh, uh, maybe first, uh, Sky, uh, if you can share with us a little bit of um three you know after having watched the film two, people have questions to know what happened after that and um and i wonder if you want to give us any kind one of we're back of any of the, the the people that we uh came to know through the film and then Jahan, i'm going to come back to you to speak again about how we can all be part of some of the action going on globally around this issue sky go ahead um well, well <clears throat> There's good news and bad news because we, we, we left the country immediately prior to the um, pandemic beginning. Um, but, but there's good news even within the added pressure of COVID-19 ravaging the country. Um, and that is that, that um, Dr. Al-Sadiq, Aida, as well as Makia, soldier on. Um, they, they are continuing to do this incredible work as medical providers to save ch children on a daily basis. Um, and and that, that inspires me, right? That inspires me to, to continue to do our work um, to, you know, because I, I am, I'm, even now, I, I am angry, right? I am angry that um, children are dying for simple lack of food even with the global resources that, that we have to bear on it. And I hope that uh, by championing uh, Dr. Al-Sadiq and championing the Kia's work, we can be one small piece of raising global awareness about this and marshalling action. Um, in terms of the children that we show in the film, um, there, there's wonderful news, um, both Abir, Abir in the north in the Kia's clinic, 
as well as Olema in the south in, um, in the Aden hospital. They are both well on their way to recovery. Have gained Why can't they just say the city's names? Why do they have to emphasize are, the difference um, between north really and south? thriving as children. Um, and uh, Makia sends us photos from time to time, and we get photos uh, from Dr. Al-Sadiq as well. And, and since we followed them, they're visually completely different girls. And, and in addition to that, good news is even better news that both, both of them, both of the Makia and Aida believe that the stunting will probably be minimal with both girls um, if the current nutrition program continues. So we're very, very hopeful that um, they're going to make a mostly a full recovery. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. That's, that's uh, wonderful to hear. I highly really recommend watching the movie, guys. I'm so happy to hear that as well. Yes, yes. Um, so, Jihan, you know, as we wrap up this conversation, uh, you know, it feels as though we could uh, unpack more and really try to understand better, you know, how, how to, what does it look like uh, for mobilization to try and stop the war? What does it look like to advocate for the right incentives for a peace process? But tell us about what's coming up next week and other ways that people who've joined us today can be involved. Sure, yeah, we've been at this for almost six years now. Um, so we do have an action that we're organizing on January 25th, um, which will be days after the US presidential inauguration here in the US. Uh, it is also a day before Saudi Arabia's Davos in the Desert, a future investment initiative. Saudi Arabia is trying to garner uh, more funding, uh, which was cut off after Khashoggi's murder. murder. Um, and the Yemeni Alliance Committee and core organizers drafted a joint statement, and it's titled War, World Says No War on Yemen. It's in five languages, condemning the role of Western powers in the war in Yemen. Um, so far, 200 organizations from over 20 countries have signed on to this uh, joint statement. And we're really calling for an end to U.S. support, U.K. support as well, and to Western support for the war on Yemen, and for Biden specifically uh, to pass a war powers resolution with teeth. See, we were talking earlier, and um, I think language is important. Um, we need to be really specific about what type of support uh, does the West need to end, and it specifically needs no, to end. Uh, let's be fair for the people that don't speak English. Lastly, the blockade, the hunger, I mean, hunger award really just illustrated how devastating hunger can, can hit, especially on children. So lifting the blockade and opening all land yes. and seaports is the final ask. And on the 25th, there will be protests uh, in New York, California, Chicago, Germany, around the world. Uh, and we're encouraging folks to hold protests or digital webinars um, wherever it's safe. I know that COVID is still alive and well. So please uh, join us either online or on the streets. Um, I mean, this is an anti-war movement and it's growing into a global one. So wherever you are, join us on January 25th and beyond because we know that um, this war has is, is over six years old now, and it's going to take all of us, all hands on deck. So uh, follow us on social media to plug in. Thank you, Jahan, and um, thank you, Sky, uh, and to all of you that have joined here today. Um, you know, we will be sending uh, uh, follow-up information with many of the links about uh, the global action to stop the war in Yemen on the 25th as well as some other things that have been shared in the very vibrant chat uh, during our conversation today. Uh, once again, we've sensed and felt by your participation today that you care, um, that you want to look towards and not away from this humanitarian crisis. And I really invite each of you to try to find a way to contribute to the things that Jahan has talked about or in other ways that you can. Uh, it's unacceptable, as Sky told us in the beginning, that people can die of starvation from a man-made conflict in 2021. And that's the reality that's going on. Every Yemeni day. Um, Committee Alliance. So, Sky, uh, you have your hand up. Go ahead. That's yeah, what just, just one, I just want to lead people to the resources we have on our website. So, um, there are some questions about watching the film. We have two more screenings upcoming 
um, uh, that are by RSVP on um, the 21st and the 26th of this month. You can um, you can find us on hungerward.org, where we also have for U.S. residents a governmental intervention outreach tool where you can reach your own senators, your own representatives to encourage the efforts that are uh, upcoming that Jahan has been speaking to and reach out directly to intervene um, with those who represent you in the government. We also have a link where you can actually donate directly to the, the clinic and the hospital um, featured in the film. Um, and, and, and those funds go directly to those facilities. So I just wanna, that's all at hungerward.org. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, thank you each of you for making time on this Saturday to pay attention, to care about what's happening in Yemen. And uh, we look forward to another opportunity. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Nina. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good. Have a good bye. Assalamualaikum.